It all starts with one idea. Have you ever wondered how today's top CEOs, business leaders, and people who work for the most innovative companies in the world found success? Join host George Davison as he explores the innovators that are shaping tomorrow's world today. Welcome to another edition of The Innovators. And today, we have a guest. His name is Steve Johnson, and he is with the Idaho National Labs Space Division. And wait till you hear this title. He is the Director of Space, Nuclear Power, and Isotope Technologies. That's a big title there, Steve. It's a very big title. Lots of interesting work. Well, welcome to our show. Happy to be here. All right. Well, I'm gonna. I have some questions for you today, and I hope you'll just, you know, share everything you can with our audience. And uh, maybe we should start with, you know, can you talk a little bit about what does Idaho National Lab Space Division do? We do uh, power systems for NASA in uh, remote and hostile environments. So a remote, hostile environment would be, could you describe what that is? Let's say on the moon, on Mars, cruising mm-hmm. by Pluto, cruising by Saturn, those sort of environments. Yes. Now, those are pretty harsh environments. Yes. So in your division, what does the future look like? The future looks like lots of different applications of nuclear power uh, equipment to uh, help empower um, different uh, space missions, whether it's going to Mars for a sample recovery mission, uh, another launch out of the solar system, like uh, a lot of people see the Voyager probes. Those are out of our solar system. There's a mission out there called Interstellar Probe, which is a mission that it's going to take them 50 years to get out there, and they need a power system that's going to work that long. That's the, that's the future. Wow. So I, I imagine these power systems that you're talking about, you know, these aren't big vehicles, are they? So, no. Uh, everything with NASA is very much about how small can you make it and how little can you make it weigh. Mm, that Ma- makes sense because it's very expensive to shoot things up into space. Very expensive, and it's all about mass and volume. Mm-hmm. So then can you talk about what your position is responsible for? Yes. Uh, When NASA needs a power system to help enable a mission, Mm -hmm. and they've determined that a nuclear-powered power system is the best way to go, they contact the Department of Energy, and the Department of Energy turns to the Idaho National Laboratory and its other partner national labs to provide that power system. And typically, we get that sort of call about five to six years prior to launch date, as they say. And we work very hard to make certain we get the right power system to the NASA customer in mm-hmm. time and that it's going to do what they want it to do. All right. So let's, let's walk this back a little bit, Steve. How did you get started on a course in your life to, to be a, you know, going into this kind of work? Okay, for me, it started very, very early. I'm in my late 50s, so I grew up in the Apollo era. I was that kid that built that two-foot-tall Saturn V rocket yes. that got uh, an encyclopedia set called Above and Beyond that had all that neat NASA stuff and aeronautical stuff in it. And I tended to focus on you know nerdy stuff, science and mathematics, when I went through school. Mm-hmm. And that was my start um, back in the late 60s, early 70s, graduated 1980, went into chemistry and uh, mathematics and uh, later uh, laser beams for Mm -hmm. doing analysis, but that was my start. That's very interesting. Um, So, but just so, uh, yeah, the rocket world, that when I was in high school, I started a club there, and it was the Rocket Club, and... uh, I, it was so exciting. We would all build our rockets, and then on the weekend, we'd go out and shoot them off, and uh, our imaginations would just soar. So, uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. 
you know, having having things to think about or to give you inspiration when you're younger to shoot for, right? Absolutely. And you can I, I'm a firm believer in you can never tell how things are going to finally come together mm -hmm. uh, later. The things that you do earlier in life that you think, well, this is okay for a little while, but if you retain that knowledge, when you come to what you really want to do, it all kind of blends together, mm -hmm. and you, you never know what's going to be at the end of the pathway. You, you always need to remain engaged and learn what you can wherever you're, you're at. Mm -hmm. Well said. So... How important would you say innovation is at the Idaho National Lab Space Division? It's very important. Uh, I, when I look at the things like when we, uh, let's see, you look at the, the Mars missions from 2002, mm -hmm. Spirit and Opportunity, and when I, I first looked at the films, the films from the, at that time, the Jet Propulsion Lab, I'm like, okay, how are you going to get this down? I looked at this three-dimensional triangle thing that was going to go down through the atmosphere, bounce around a whole lot, and pop open. There was a rover. I was like, there's no way that's going to work. <laughs> and uh, and we, we, made, uh, we delivered the heat sources that are on Spirit and Opportunity that worked for many years. And we later followed up with power systems for the Curiosity rover and the Perseverance rover. And again, I looked at that and I'm like, okay, you're coming down and you're slowing down from 24,000 miles an hour down to like 10 feet a second. I was like, you're kidding. That's not going to work. And you watch the films and then you watch the actual landing. I thought, wow, what a, a neat thing to be part of. Mm -hmm. Very much so. So figuring out how to make things like that happen is there's a lot of innovation in trying to think differently, think outside the box. Uh, absolutely. I, you, can't, you can't apply exactly the only things that you know that work on Earth to something that's going to be on another planet or orbiting another planet. You've got to think outside the box, yes. and you've got to check it out. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? I never really thought of it that way, because everything you have to think about out in space has to be in like space world, right? There's no gravity. There's there's so many unique things out there we don't even understand yet. And you have to try to envision that world and come up with products or solutions that let you kind of navigate it. Absolutely the case. And for specifically for what we do in Idaho, um, our power systems, one, there's not a backup on board. Two, once they're on the spacecraft and launched, there's no repairs or anything. Secondly, we basically certify them to work for 17 years. Mm -hmm. They take seven, eight, nine months to get to Mars, and then they have to work for years and years after that. And you think about that, and there's some things that we do that are very you know, quality-driven, uh, little things, uh, certified torque wrenches, and all these things. And people mm -hmm. go like, w w why are you doing it so rigorously? It's like, it's got to work for 17 years. And you've got a, a $2.5 billion space mission that if your part doesn't work right, it doesn't work at all. It's a lot of responsibility. It is, but it's also pretty damn cool when you get right down to it. <laughs> it sure is. It is exciting. All right, well, let's, let's keep uh, moving along here. Uh, so in your specific position, what would you say you're responsible for directly? Okay, when the uh, use of nuclear power is first thought about, they're interested in what can it do, what mm -hmm. can't it do, uh, when can you provide it, how much is it going to cost, uh, those sort of basic questions. And as uh, in my position, I'm that first contact with the Idaho National Lab. I'm there to say what we can do, what we can promise, when it can be there, and uh, what kind of interaction we can have with mm -hmm. NASA along the way. That's my job, which is to lay out the playing field, make certain we get uh, the deliverables up front, the schedule, the cost profiles, get all the coordination done within the, uh, the Department of Energy that I can do in my position, 
and, and that's uh, that's why I'm there typically every spring when NASA does its budget planning, which goes out for us uh, seven years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm there to provide those those estimates so that people can know what's available when they put out a announcement of opportunity an AO for a mission. Uh, I'll be that last point of contact. Say yes, we can provide this. And we will be there. You don't have to worry about us. We are going to be a good partner. All right. So in order to do that job, it sounds like you need quite a few different skill sets in order to be able to know, in, uh, in order to be able to make a recommendation of that type, right? The, that you can achieve this kind of an out uh, of an uh, outcome, and you do understand what the cost and all the parameters are going to be. So is it you? Do you work with a team? H- how does that function? Okay, as far as providing the product, I work with other people at Oak Ridge National Lab mm-hmm. and Los Alamos National Lab to make certain we have all the pieces and parts, as it were, along with our our uh, commercial partner for the power system. So we make certain we've got all the pieces and the parts that our production schedule will support that. Uh, so that's a coordination job. I'm also National Technical Director for Space Nuclear Power for the Department of Energy. So that is something that I, I know the right people to call to get the right information. Mm. So that's a that's an important part. As far as the costing, uh, I've done the costing for over the last decade. Uh, that's a coordination thing as well, as well as making certain you know all the right people to call in all the right partner organizations. There's lots of little pieces and parts, yes. and we've done this. Uh, for uh, four space missions now. We're getting ready for uh, a fifth one, a 2020 launch, uh, Dragonfly going to Titan. So it's, it's, uh, it's knowledge of who's, who the players are, mm-hmm. what they can provide, the costs, uh, factoring in if you need additional margin, and uh, knowing who to contact down at Kennedy Space Center for the other pieces and parts that fit in later on. I, I've done that a few times now, and so that's... Uh, that's what I do. Sounds like a pretty big team and group of people you're pulling together. Uh, and maybe in, in the world of the education side of things, you know, that's project-based learning. You know, learning how to not only do a project, but how to manage a project and how to communicate a project to other third parties. It's, that's a skill set that I know project-based learning, you know, learning is doing in school because I'm involved with some of that. But it sounds like those skill sets transfer very nicely into what you're doing. They really do. Uh, You need to learn uh, some of the technical aspects to give you that confidence behind the the project management skills, but it is all the same. I mean, it's knowing your pieces and parts, how they fit together, the sequencing, Mm -hmm. um, knowing the costs, knowing uh, the contingencies you need to incorporate in that. And but in the end, um, you know, on the DOE side, between the three national labs, uh, I'm talking about uh, two to three hundred people that contributed to that. Uh, but you know, the the magic part is when you're in that last four months and you're down at Kennedy Space Center and you're down mm-hmm. there with a hundred people from the Jet Propulsion Lab or Applied Physics Lab, who's ever managing the mission. And you've got a couple, three dozen of your people delivering a power system, and you're fitting in with all the subcontractors down there at Kennedy. That is the greatest group dynamic exercise I've ever <laughs> seen. It all culminates with watching a rocket go off. I mean, that's that's pretty way cool. It is really cool. I mean, it, big inspiration. Um, and to be a part of it, you must be very um, proud of yourself. It's very satisfying. Yes. Because you're usually at the end of a five- to six-year um spin up on it and uh, when you get to that point it was a little bit um, more interesting this last launch uh, the July 2020 Mars 2020 Perseverance rover uh, we were all down there and everything but of course uh, Cocoa Beach uh, was deserted uh, it was during the pandemic we were mm-hmm. down there April to July and there was nobody down there if you weren't involved with the mission not yeah. out and about well Thank you for your uh, contribution to making all this happen. And I'm sure somewhere along the way, there were others that contributed to you. Did you have any mentors when you were, let's say, in high school or younger or even high college that helped to start you on a course? Uh, several on the way. Um, I'll focus maybe on, on uh, some in the 
let's see, I had a chemistry teacher in in, uh, in high school. I had a couple of years of chemistry through him, and he was always somebody that was very inspirational, and, you know, hard work, and taught me all the stuff that he could, and mm-hmm. that was a, a nice uh, launching board for college. And uh, other people on the way uh, just... Uh, just you know work hard learn what you learn and uh, you know don't don't worry about looking too far down the track just uh, you've got a job do your job well and good things will happen that was something when I went to the national lab system I had several good mentors uh, they all did it a little bit differently um, but they were very inspirational and uh, it's fantastic now if I can grab somebody who needs some uh, need some mentoring now or need some comments. I've had people come in, they're like, oh, okay, I don't know about this or this. And I'm like, hey, just, mm-hmm. you know, this is where you're at. Where do you want to go? Well, I'm not certain. I said, well, you're, you're at a pretty good spot. You know, work hard, do well, and keep your eyes open. And if there's something out there that I can help you with as far as a direction, a recommendation, uh, I'm here to help you out, trying to give back a little bit. Yes. Uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of young people kind of wandering out there right now, you know, just like we were. We didn't know... I'm sure you didn't know that you were going to be in this position when you were a youngster, and I didn't know I was going to be in this position when I was a youngster, but mentors help to, you know, give us pointers along the way, build some basic uh, hardworking skills, make a commitment. How, how It sounds like you really like what you're doing. So was it just a struck of luck that you happened to find that, or, you know, how did that happen for you? Uh, because I think a lot of people that are younger really look at people our age and say, well, how? How did you get there? And uh, if you have some insight there, it might it might help our audience. For me, kind of the magic moment was 2002. I was managing an electron microscopy lab, had a small group of people, and we we're, we were doing good work and working hard, and, and finally uh, DOE came in. They said, hey, you know, we've got this uh, the stuff in Ohio that due to the fallout from 9-11, mm-hmm. uh, we need to move somewhere else. And the lab looked around, and they said, hey, you know, you, you do something with plutonium-238. I'm like, yeah, I'm a Ph.D. chemist. I manage a lab. We analyze samples with it. They said, oh, you're it. And so we were given three weeks to put together a $15 million proposal, uh, on how to move a, a, a medium-sized project that needed a new building and all this stuff. And yeah, I w- kind of walked away from that. I said, can I go to Ohio and look at this? They said, no, no, you can't do that. And so I called together a big meeting on Monday, and this is Friday, and I'm sitting there going like, wow, what am I going to tell people? So I spent the weekend with, with butcher block white paper sheets, you know, three foot tall, right. sketching out stuff. And that was what I conducted the meeting with on Monday. Mm-hmm. And people were looking at me. I said, hey, we need this put together, buffed up, shined in three weeks. Ended up being a $15 million proposal that we sent out. And I knew all the right people to call. But, there, you know, some people were like, you know, you, you've never handled something this big. You know, why, you know, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of um, just suspicion that it was just an exercise. And, and uh, we pushed it through, and within three months, we had the project coming our way, and uh, then I got a whole bunch of learning experiences mm-hmm. over several years. I'll tell you, I can tell your experience because um, you said butcher block paper, and uh, yeah. uh, you know that's a that's such a valuable asset, right? I mean, they, it's, it, for all of you out there who don't know what that is. Uh, when you go into the butcher shop, you know, that where you get your meats in the grocery, there's a very big spool of white paper there. And it's like the greatest paper to draw out all your ideas. And it just goes on and on and on and on. So you can really uh, get inspired and just keep going. And uh, so and we've we've used plenty of butcher paper over the years around here. It's just funny to hear you bring it up. So, um, all right. So let's say, so you had a science teacher who inspired you. That's that's wonderful. Um, were there any? Was how about uh, anybody else? I mean, what were the, some other things that when you were younger um, that were impactful to you? In can you go back into high school at all? Was there anybody there, mentor, uh, maybe a family member, or you know, 
did you like taking things apart when you were younger and figuring out how they worked, or did you just kind of how did it happen? I was always just really geared towards science courses. So when I went into guidance counselor high school, uh, I got kind of set on that that avenue where I took the biology, the couple of years of chemistry, the physics, the earth and space science, mm-hmm. the mathematics. That was just something that really resonated with me. Uh, but I want to stress one thing. I also had a counselor sent me down my senior year he said okay yeah you've got all the neat science stuff and you've taken all the math the school has he said I want you to take this course I said really he said yeah I said that that course has a reputation of being the hardest course uh, that nobody goes in there unless they're forced to he said yeah it's called English usage (laughs) it was a a hardcore grammar course I mean very hardcore he said I think you're going to college you're going to need this Mm. And uh, and he was right. It, it, it's something I've seen people, engineers and scientists I work with now, and if they're fresh out of college, it's like, you, you, what can you say? It, you you kind of get English is a second language for them because mm-hmm. it certainly isn't a first. And in the end, you can have these really great ideas, but if you can't communicate them in writing and verbally to people, yes. so speech is also an important thing I learned mm-hmm. by my... my uh, first year in college, if you can't communicate them, you can't write it down, you can't talk about it, you're not going to get that that listening to that that audience that you need. Mm-hmm. So those are really important things. No matter how smart you are, if you can't communicate it, you can't write so that people can understand it, you're not going to come across very well. It's so very true, Steve. Thank you for bringing that up because um, that's some of the things that we really focus on around here, observational analysis how to write out what it is that you're thinking, potentially how to also sketch it, because if I'm working with you at a brainstorming table and I can visualize a solution, if I can artistically draw it, you may be able to look at that and gain insight on where I'm going with my mind. So how I get an idea out of me to you and how you listen, and that's a skill, your observational skills and your listening skills at the brainstorming table are critical. And then how you come together and you compose a document or you compose a drawing that can then go out and get attention or get funding and move to the next stage is all critically important as a young innovator and and an, an innovator in their 50s for that matter, right? Mm-hmm. So basic skill sets, but critically important. Whoever that person was, your uh, counselor there who told you about English. What a blessing. And uh, thank you for passing that along because it doesn't come up very often. Uh, Yeah, people tend to stress STEM uh, a lot, which is uh, is important. But the communication angle, I had another professor uh, my first year in uh, college and it was at the end of the year and he was heading off to a, a bigger university. And he said, so what do you, he said, you know, I like you, you're doing well in chemistry. He said, uh, are you thinking about going to graduate school? I'm like, yeah, I'm 18 years old. That's a long ways down the road, but maybe. Right. He said, let me tell you something. He said, you know, if you get that PhD, he said, uh, you're not guaranteed of anything. But he said, think of it as a, a invitation to a party. Mm-hmm. He said, it gets in the door. He said, once you're in the door, what happens is up to you. But he mm-hmm. said, it is the invitation to get into the party. He said, and then you, if you, you've got ideas, you've got opportunity to sell those ideas to people, uh, and, and you, you never know what happens then. But he said, you, you need the invitation into the party. Well said. Not more wisdom from mentors, right? Yes. I'm glad you're passing that along. Any other, uh, any, any other things popping in your mind right now that you think would be uh, good to share with them? I come from eastern Idaho now, Blackfoot, Idaho, which is known as being the spud capital of the United States. <laughs> okay, a lot of people are just totally bewildered, even people in Idaho, when I say, hey, we make power systems for NASA, and they're just dumbfounded. But you can do great things and contribute to really spectacular missions if you just work hard and keep your future in front of you. So how do I start? I want to do that. So what would what would be your first recommendation, Steve? 
Uh, STEM is important. Communications are important. I have uh, 50 people in my division. We're supported by others. We have people that do hands-on work, people that do quality assurance. We have engineers. We have training people that contribute to our work. Lots of different pathways to that successful thing. I have job openings right now mm -hmm. that we're recruiting for. Uh, a hint to people that when you go into a job interview, spend five minutes on Google, type in the name of the division, the name of the job, pull stuff up. I'm always amazed when I sit down to interview people, and we get a, a little bit of press coverage doing what I do. And I say, so why do you want a job here? And they're, they're like, I, I don't know. I just need a job. I'm like, wow, you spent zero time on Google figuring out what we did. Mm -hmm. And that works for anything, any job interview you go into. Figure out what it is and try to, try to make yourself interesting to that employer. Yes. Yeah, that's well said again. Because we we do when we do technology development, it's you can do technology development in a bubble, or you can try to integrate it into an organization structure. And that's one of the things we've learned to do. We refer to it as inventigration or in innovation integration, however you want to say it. But basically, it means don't create or invent in a bubble where you don't know where your outcome. I need partners. I need to integrate into a certain system. So if I'm going to go in for an interview, um, and all organizations need fresh, young talent coming up uh, uh, in their organization. So, yeah, I mean, learning about that organization a little makes sense to me. And I, I'm i kind of shocked that people you know, don't know that. So do know that. Do your research. If it's something that you really, really want to do, um, what can you learn about that organization or the people that are there so that you can start to talk their language, so to speak, during the interview process, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So um, let's see here. Let's go back in time for a moment. And uh, if you could do one thing over again in your high school, in your high school days, what would it be and why? I might have taken less science and math and just explored other things, fun things, electives. Mm. Uh, and that's something I would have carried forward in, into college. I went through college in four years. I double majored in chemistry and mathematics. So I, I had two electives in four years. And just explore, uh, reach out there, do those fun things. Because at the end, you never know how those things are all going to fit together at the end. But... Uh, reach out. I would do things like um, I would have spent more time learning how to communicate well. That was mm -hmm. something I learned later in life and I was kind of that typical nerd that didn't know how to do that very well. And so some you know, communication courses at the National Lab and those sorts of things. But do those things earlier in life. Give those mm -hmm. public uh, talks. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's about raising animals or uh, you know uh, Whatever, uh, rebuilding furniture, which is something I learned later in life, or uh, just any of those sorts of things. Reach out and broaden yourself. Mm. You will, that'll serve you well long term. More balance. So I, that's what I'm taking away there. The, um, so one of the things that our audience should understand is that my interpretation of Steve uh, right now is that you're very technology oriented, very math, very science, very physics. Uh, you've heard him say, you know, nerd, right? And I think that uh, there's, so if you're one of those kinds of people out there in this audience right now, um, you should be able to take, a, take away from that because we talk a lot about STEM and STEAM um, in this, uh, in our discussions. But the sense of balance for somebody that is really, really, really drawn in by science and math, I think it's important to hear your message, to broaden it out a little bit, pick up those communication skills, those writing skills, and, and, and other things. Find a few other variable interests that may fall outside your space so that you can learn from those directions as well, right? Absolutely the case. I've had the pleasure of being able to travel internationally to support the Department of Energy to uh, England, to France, a couple times to Russia, to Korea. Uh, and uh, amazingly for me, I use long 
long flights like that to within reason take up conversation with my seatmates to help my uh small you know my uh just my my chit chat and so forth yeah. and, and try to uh broad myself out a little bit I uh, don't want to be that bore at the party over in the corner and uh, just learn those different things and you'd be amazing at the uh, discussions you can have inside airports with people that English is definitely a second language but mm -hmm. they want to talk to you about uh, you know World War II or something like that from an entirely different perspective mm -hmm. and it's nice to have uh, inform you know some body of knowledge that you can draw on to at least get involved in those sorts of discussions learn a lot of different perspectives that way yes yeah i i'm really happy that you've brought it up and that you're really making this a big part of our story today because a lot of folks that are really in their mind a lot working on serious challenges and serious problems they do tend to be more inward and non-communicative and we need the communication we need to understand um you know if you're if your mind is working in real deep uh, on real deep challenges there's real value to communicating that to others uh you can ignite other people's imaginations to join that that other kind of party out there that nerd party right um because there's a, there's another form of communication there which is really exciting um solving the challenges of the future and uh so good point i'm glad you i'm glad you're bringing it up and uh, you know i think you're you're speaking today uh, you know you've really worked on this if it was a big challenge for you i think you've accomplished your mission and got over that one can always improve <laughs> well done um, all right so let's take a peek here let's keep going uh let's see we talked about the stem classes but uh or the the importance of stem and some other things going on there but how important would you say it is for a student to get hands-on experience to build the skills they might need in their adult lives. Like actually get your hands dirty and get the hands-on experience. I think that's very important. It's something I try even uh, even today, later in life. Um, when we took over a portion of the space program in 2002, uh, I was facing tremendous challenges. I, I needed to move um, 28 tractor trailer loads of equipment out of Ohio in nine months. We needed to design a building. We ended up building a building in the middle of winter in Idaho. Uh, I spent, um, for nine months, I spent one to two weeks a year back in Ohio, not because I needed to low, know how to build plywood boxes and move equipment around, but I needed, I had eight people on the ground there. I needed to get to know them need to make certain that they knew that they could pick up the phone and get the support that they needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, to learn those things, I needed to know how difficult it was to get uh, timely uh, trailers dropped off, filled up, so I was, you know, so I could be out there on the ground when the guy came over. He said, uh, yeah, they're going to pick up the trailer. They're not going to give us one. I said, whoa, okay, that's not going to work. We got another load ready to go. He walked me over. The, the truck driver gave me a phone. His boss was on there. He said, this company misappropriated this trailer from me three months ago, and I'm not giving him another one. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so we had a discussion for about five minutes. And I said, okay, I don't have anything to do with what this corporation, national corporation, did to you, but I really have this need. And so I talked to him about that need for three or four minutes, and he said, okay, hand the phone back to the driver. So he handed it back to the driver, and, and within five minutes, he had arranged for another empty trailer to be delivered. Because mm -hmm. I was just sitting there talking with him, and I, I really had a need, and I'm like, you know, I, I know you're upset with this other corporation, but, uh, you know, you and I need to work together on this. So yeah. those sorts of things, I needed to jump in to learn that sort of stuff, uh, uh, I learned that uh, trucks hold so many thousand pounds east of the Mississippi and can hold more west of the Mississippi. All those things that you never thought you needed to know coming out of graduate school. Um, those were things that I needed to jump in. So at least when I was talking to people when there was a, a delay or something, I'd say, hey, you know, this is this is what's going on. They're like, oh, okay, you're following this. I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those sorts of things. I typically try to do that. 
some people who work for me are like, why are you still around here? I'm like, I'll be out of here once I understand the process and understand how to help you. And so that's something that I've applied through the years. And uh, you know, when I was wandering around and we were pouring our first wall at the end of January of 2004, so we're, we're, it's a 40-foot wall because that's the distance between construction joints, and it's 15-foot tall, and we've got uh, water lines with warm uh, ethylene glycol, and we've got hydraulic thumpers, and we're doing it at 6 degrees outside. And uh, I'm calling my project manager from the airport, and I said, how's it going? He's like, well, it's going good. Well, okay. He said, uh, the, the hydraulic lines actually froze, and da -da -da, but he said, don't worry about it. He said, we've got this, and uh, he said, I've got a line of concrete trucks here. We're doing the QA on the concrete, and mm -hmm. you just don't worry about it. And uh, so that was, I had six months of that, and uh, having to call DOE headquarters while I'm standing on the roof of a building that's partially constructed to describe how it's going. Those are the sorts of things that I got to learn about for six months. Mm -hmm. I always thought that was great, uh, a little harrowing at times in terms of not personal safety, but just in terms of, wow, this has got to be together here in not much time. And uh, from a communication point of view, about February of 2004, the program executive from the Pluto New Horizons mission came by, and our power system was due a little bit over a year from them, July 2005 down in Florida. And I'm wandering him around this building site, and he's looking at a slab of concrete with a couple, three walls up. I said, don't worry. I said, it'll be done this summer. I'll staff it this fall. We'll train. We'll do all this. And uh, about uh, three years later, when he was presenting my group with a NASA National Group Award for producing the power system, he said, yeah. He wandered me around there in February of 2004. So I went away from there. He said, I colored you red on our schedule. And I kept you red all the way through launch. <laughs> so I, I just thought you should know that. <laughs> Coloring you red, I mean, I think that means he didn't have confidence in your uh, getting it done? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So, but uh, he and the project manager, uh, Glenn Fountain from the Applied uh, Research Lab, uh, Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins, both flew out to give us the award. They said, you pulled it off. Well done. Well done. And that's a great lesson to pass along, right? It's you can you you got engaged, you learned about the details of how this construction had to be to have the building a certain way so that a mission could be accomplished later and later on. You didn't want to leave the details to somebody else. You had so and that puts you in a better position because once you understand, then as things are coming together, you understand what's possible and what's not possible. And therefore, you can push a timeline. You can push your teammates. Know where the human being is going to get too tired or, you know, they're going to make mistakes versus... There just are so many variables that come into these kinds of projects. But by getting your hands dirty and uh, by doing it and getting into the grimy details, nothing escapes you. So you're able to push and have confidence in where you're trying to go. I, I've i done that myself <laughs> numerous times. And when I look back on this, I think it goes back in time. I, mean, I can go all the way back to my high school days and even middle school days. And I, I don't know if it was the same for you, but for me, I always had a lot of chores. And, you know, I didn't know much about how to maintain a house, but I can, I, I, I'll tell you right now, I can do it very well and I can I know how to do it properly and with a certain amount of time and what are the best resources to you know make that mission happen etc 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 but those were basic chore skills that I learned in order to um, function in my home as a young person did you do chores did you have chores as a young person by chance yes so your parents were tough on chores is that right uh, yeah I think that's a fair assessment yeah. yes I um, <clears throat> for me it was you better do the chores. And I'm going to show you how to do these chores, and you're going to do them right. And every day when uh, work was done, and it was before dinner, the chores were inspected. So I learned you're not only going to do those chores, you're going to do a good job. And if you don't, after dinner, you're going to go do them again. So you learn. I, anyway, I learned to do do the chores, build skills, and um, 
And to do them right, are, unfortunately, that's reality. You do have to do it again. And I've transferred that all the way through my business life as well. Um, did you have any other responsible activities that you, I mean, when I say that, I don't want to sound condescending, and I think maybe the way I said that's the wrong way. When we're younger, we're given uh, chores or responsibilities. Were there any other things that you were um, told to do that you really maybe didn't want to do, but you did, and it, it helped to build a very basic, basic skill set? Uh, no, I'll take that direction a little bit different, or take that uh, question in a little bit different direction. Um, so there were four of us, myself and uh, three sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, I was the only one that went to college. And so for me, and, and self-funded for the latter part, but I, I went to college for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And that was something that was uh, tough for me. I won't say there wasn't support at home, but there was just uh, just a really... Um, wasn't something they were used to. Mm-hmm. In the last six years, I went 12 months a year and so forth, and they're like, "Okay, what's you know what, what's what is this?" Yes. And so for me, that was it. you know it was pretty much all me because they were like, "Well, yeah, you can come home if you want to. You know, your bedroom's still there." But I was like, no, I wanted to go out and 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 do that hard push and try to make something of myself and go mm-hmm. forward. So that was it's not quite a chore, but it was a bit of a a, a re- responsibility challenge for me. Mm-hmm. And I was, uh, you know, more than a day's dra- uh, travel away from home mm-hmm. and stayed there and, and uh, pushed through. And uh, my first couple, three years in graduate school, uh, my experiments didn't go the way I wanted to. And after three years, I was like, okay, I'm I'm not smart enough for this. And I sat down with one of my mentors, my my advisor, and he talked to me for like three hours on a Saturday. And he just... He was coming in to work, and I said, you know, I, I'm out of here. This is just not working mm-hmm. out. And At the end of that, he said, okay, I want to move you on to a different project. He said, you're one of my best students. Just give me another year. And at the end of that time, uh, I completed a couple of things, had a couple of publications out. And then a year later, uh, when I eventually left graduate school, I had eight publications, and the world looked entirely different, and I was very thankful for that guy pulling me back from the edge. Very nice. A little course correction along the way, huh? Yes. And yeah, those, those are nice to get. Oh, I'm glad that they, I'm glad he did that. Uh, or we wouldn't be having this chat today. So, um, Let's see here. So let's chat a little bit about people in general. Because um, we have a lot of audience out there and they're probably wondering, um, will they achieve something in life? So do you believe anybody can be successful? Yes, I do. Um, you need to take a, you know, if you're just sitting there and you don't know where you're going, think about what you enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. But don't be concerned about how much money you can make doing it. Think about something you truly enjoy doing mm-hmm. just for doing it. And once you've picked those one or two or three, four things, and maybe it's just one or two, take a look at it and talk to people in that field. See what you can do that uh, maybe you can make money doing it. Um, okay, again, trying to enhance my small talk capabilities on an airplane. I sat next to this guy, and he was there with, I don't know, ripped out jeans and everything. And I was flying from Salt Lake City to uh, Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. And he was going to Cleveland. And, and he was sitting there uh, having having some cocktails. And, and he was probably about 30 years old. And I said, so uh, what do you do? He said, uh... Yeah, he said, I do pyrotechnics. I'm like, really? Hmm. I said, uh, is that is that good to you? He said, well, he said, I'm going into Cleveland. And he said, I'm doing this. And I just stared at him. And he said, yeah, a lot of the young guys, they go to school. They get all these degrees. They learn about chemicals. He said, but if they come and they intern with me, he said, within about one year, I can get them to a skill level where they're making six figures. And now this is the lead pyrotechnic guy for Beyonce and Jay-Z. Mm. And he was flying in for them to do their big shows in Cleveland a few years back. And I thought, okay, this guy, he, you know, he's got it going on. He had just come back from L.A. visiting his family, his wife. 
and you know he looked like somebody that was itinerant whatever but uh no he's like no he said i i can show you how to do the big pyrotechnics i can do this and i'm like hey you're working for beyonce and jay-z i'm like yeah you're probably doing pretty okay (laughs) and uh but that was somebody who figured out what they wanted to do he didn't have a college degree in anything he just picked it up by having somebody teach him something Mm -hmm. and kept working on it and he was at the top of his game i thought that was pretty neat would you like to tell our audience, because some of them may be pretty young, what pyrotechniques are? Because they're probably intrigued now. Okay, uh, yeah, the, uh, layman's word for it, fireworks. <laughs> okay, all that bright, sparkly stuff you see at the uh, Super Bowl halftime show or any of the big things uh, from big cities, uh, Las Vegas, New York on the 4th of July. Yeah, that, that, was, that was something that uh, he really liked, had the right intern, no college degree learned it and was running a big crew and making a whole lot of money doing it. So again, pick something that you like to do, Mm -hmm. focus on it, talk to people in the field. You can probably figure out a way to make a living doing it, maybe better than make a living. Steve, it's great advice. Thanks for another another, uh, good bit of information. I I think if you're lucky enough to find what you like, you know, it's not work, is it? It's like it's intriguing and you want to go do it. You want to jump out of bed in the morning and go get started with what you're doing. I think some of the challenge is finding what you like. Right? Uh, absolutely. But I, I've had other people on the way, other mentors tell me, they said, yeah, they said, uh, okay, yeah, you got degrees in this, figure out what you like to do. Because they said at some point you, you may have that tough stretch where you're not making a lot of money, whatever else. And he said, if you're doing what you like to do, mm-hmm. he said, you'll get through those tough stretches. But if you're doing something that you were only doing because you could make a lot of money at one point in time and all of a sudden that's dried up or changed, then you, you, you don't have a whole lot uh, to uh, keep you going during yes. the day. Yes. Well said. All right, so let's shift back for a minute. We're going to go back to the nuclear energy, uh, the nuclear uh, area for a minute. Um, What do you think the next big innovation will be in the nuclear industry, and how can students today prepare for that innovation in the future? Okay, so from my background, we also do developmental work in the application of nuclear reactors for space. If we ever want to get men to Mars and get them back again, we're going to need uh, propulsion systems that are nuclear based to get there mm-hmm. and that work is has been uh, ongoing for several years but still still is in its infancy mm-hmm. uh, that's a neat field to work on or if we want to get men to have a colony on the moon they're going to need power solar won't do it um, half the time you're at the moon you're in the dark uh, 14 days at a time so having a, a, a nuclear power plant on the moon would be truly neat. Those are things that are are out there. They're under development. Uh, they're 10, 15 years off. Plenty of opportunity for somebody to jump in there and uh, and make a mark and learn something pretty neat and uh, really contribute to that. So that that's, that's, I think, is a hot area. There are several uh, areas where NASA is currently spending uh, millions, tens of millions of dollars per year in. And, they, and NASA spends it with, within NASA, within universities, within private companies, lots of different venues that you can contribute to that. Mm. That's what I think is a important avenue going forward for nuclear power. Nuclear power on the moon. That sounds so exciting. I, I wish I was uh, 12 years old again. <laughs> I'd probably start, you know, that would really make my imagination soar. So let's, let's say I am 12 and I... There, I imagine um, in order to even begin to dream in that space, I better be, you know, I better do my math homework. I better, you know, be focusing on some of the, what do you say are some of the basic courses a young person should focus on? Again, math is good. Um, chemistry, biology, physics, uh, earth and space science. Uh, mm-hmm. People, I mean, one of the questions that came up recently that, uh, things probably nobody ever thinks about. Okay, if you're going to have a man colony on Mars, what's it going to be constructed of? Mm-hmm. Okay, so people are trying they are trying to get samples back from Mars because if you're going to go to Mars, 
I don't think we're going to be hauling bags of here in Portland cement up there and, and a whole bunch of water. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to take a look at the regolith, the soil of Mars, mm -hmm. and figure out what's it made of and what can we add to it to essentially make uh, Martian concrete. And although people may go, ick, it's like, okay, so what have you got on Mars? Uh, you know, you, you've got the regolith. Well, what's the other part? So they're, they're using different forms of, uh, of urine to try to be that liquid that they yes. to uh, make concrete so they can actually build things on Mars. Because, again, uh, mass is everything, and you're not going to be hauling steel girders up there or slabs of preformed concrete. You need a way of making a permanent structure once you're there. And, and water is very heavy, so we don't want to have to blast that up into space. So urine makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, th those are different aspects there's lots of different aspects if you're uh, if you're focusing on biology uh they're they're looking at the different things that have lived on mars in the mm -hmm. past so you d you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be involved with space stuff mm -hmm. uh, just kind of a take home message there there's lots of different angles you need a way of uh if you can think of a more efficient way of splitting say frozen water you may find on the moon or mars to get oxygen and hydrogen that's a fuel another you know, that's another different angle. Lots of different angles that you can apply up to something that NASA is going to do on Mars or on the moon. All right. Let's, let's uh, take another turn here and imagine for a minute that we have um, education leaders who are guiding um, K-12 in our country, and um, they're sitting here with us. What do you think some of your recommendations to them would be to help prepare our students for the future? I would say just open up activities and, and maybe a, you know being a, a, a more of a space oriented guy, take an activity like I don't care a mission to Pluto, man to the moon. And really step backwards. Take a look at all the people. Take a look at those people's qualifications, what they did in their earlier life. Mm -hmm. So that people can relate and say, oh, yeah, everybody knows Neil Armstrong went to the moon. Great. Well, back up the, the calendar on, on Neil Armstrong or any of the other great people or even more modern day, more contemporary people. Just say, hey, this is where they started out life. You know, they, they were just like you. Or they were just like me. <clears throat> They had humble beginnings. Uh, they they built on those beginnings to be those great people that we all know today. So that people can relate and say, oh, hey, he was just a normal guy or she was just a normal gal. And this is how they got to where they are. I think that would be an interesting case study. I think you're right. And that's a really, um, that could create a great conversation. Because you're dealing with, not theory, you're dealing with an actual person who went through a series of events. And um, because I really think they need the kind, that kind of guidance. We're moving from theory and possibilities over to actual steps that were taken. And somewhere in between there, we might find some innovative way to uh, get some courses out to the kids to move them into, a, um, let's say, an innovative education that uh, might change our future. Yeah, I think uh, people might really be surprised at the backgrounds of a whole lot of people. I mean, they look at a finished product that's 40, 50, 60 years old and has had a distinguished career, and they, they have no idea that 40 years before that, that person may have been you know, flipping hay bales in northern Michigan and, and uh, doing other mundane things like that. Steve, I can't thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for having me. For more information about the innovations and ideas changing tomorrow's world, tune into Tomorrow's World Today, now streaming on science and discovery, or visit tomorrowsworldtoday.com. For more information about the innovations and ideas changing tomorrow's world, tune into Tomorrow's World Today, now streaming on Science and Discovery.
or visit tomorrowsworldtoday.com.